you should pick and choose the traits from various people yeah. and make it your own. Yeah. Um, I, I think the main thing is um, every human, every person, every manager is unique and individual. You have to stay true to yourself. Yes. But you should never grow complacent or grow tired of every day trying to be the better version of yourself. Welcome to The Autobiography, a video series that shines the spotlight on inspiring leaders and captures the fascinating stories of leaders from their personal journey to key leadership lessons and secrets to their success. Today, I'm privileged to have Mark Rain here with me, the CEO of Mercedes-Benz South Africa. Mark orchestrated many things, but one of the things I read about Mark was that he had 50 car launches or oversaw 50 car launch launches in under five years. Wasn't in South Africa, but uh, I'm pretty sure he's going to get to that pretty quickly. And under Mark's leadership, his sales figures grew by almost 200% during that tenure. So uh, welcome, Mark. I'm really privileged to have you here. You're, uh, you're an absolute legend. And uh, um, I, think, uh, I think first things first, um, Mark has not been in any kind of fight. You fell off your bike, <laughs> I believe. Yeah, first of all, thank you for having me here. Yeah, um, I, I rode the 94.7, the ride drove on the weekend. And uh, uh, as I'm probably in every aspect of life, driven and want to exceed, go beyond. Uh, also there, I couldn't stop myself in uh, trying to race too hard and, and not be a, let's say, automotive manager, but trying to be a professional cyclist. And that ended in, up in me actually uh, taking a corner too quickly and ending up on the front yard of a Shell uh, petrol station rather wow. than staying on the bike. But um, I, I got myself patched up and actually finished the race, which which was very enjoyable. Chief, was you, you you fell off your bike and finished the race yeah. and did sub three hours. Yes, I, I managed to scrape in under three. I, uh, I mean, I was, I was telling you in the lead up to, to coming to sit down yeah. that uh, I, I cycled for about 10 years and, yeah. uh, and I could get to sub 330, yeah. but I don't think my body's made for cycling, so I, <laughs> I want to use that as an excuse, but uh, uh, sub three hours is incredible, especially if you fell off the bike, yeah. um, didn't break anything. I'm, I'm no, I, I was lucky, I just, uh, um, I got a few stitches on my knee, got a bit of uh, a few bruises on my shoulder, but otherwise I'm okay, and it, it, it's, it's interesting, so I, I, I was right hard and I was pushing myself and, and that's probably also a, a, a way I live life or I also manage um, and I fell off the bike and the first thing I thought shit is sorry I'm not supposed to that's say right. that but excuse my French um, I thought is the bike okay bike was okay then I looked and there were uh, two police guys and some medics around I said am I okay they looked at me they said you mostly okay said okay bandage me up and i wanted to continue because in that moment the main concern was i wanted to get back to the finish again yes yes you want you wanted to finish the race yeah. i mean you, you were close to the end that you felt yeah it was it yeah. was just roughly 20 k's before the end and i was just determined to continue to get going that, well well done i mean that is something that is a that is a feat of uh, of real right. i think tenacity and right. uh, and getting to the finish so where did your love of cycling and running come from because i see you 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 post quite a lot right. of uh, of content related to sport and fitness yeah. and, and sunning, running and cycling particularly? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it kind of, for me, it's, it's the counterbalance to, to my daily life. So as most of my peers, I've got a very stressful job starting early in the morning. I've got a lot of late night evening events. And, and for me, if, uh, to, to a certain degree, to keep my sanity and to keep the balance in life, I need uh, something where I can kind of get some of the energy out, but also gain energy again. And that's for me running and cycling. And um, I mean, I started that um, over 10, 15 years ago. And, and um, because I've lived in many different countries along the way, it's also for me an, uh, an access point to local society, to building friendships, to getting to know the countries I live in, uh, and also the surroundings. So if you're running and cycling, it's the perfect way to find out about um, your environment, um, where you're living, to, to, to see different areas. And, and I, I think it also strongly helps me in my daily job. So, so um, recently I was having a discussion with one of our dealers. Um, it was actually at the beginning of my tenure. And he said, yeah, uh, we've got a dealership in Lanasia. I said, yes, I know because I cycle there nearly every weekend. And, and these are things which, which, which are just um, something which drives me and which I'm very thankful for. 
Well, I, I mean, I think uh, take your hats off to you. The you know the the, the sport and uh, and the drive that you have, especially finishing after a fall at 85 kilometers. I'm still trying to process <laughs> that myself. So uh, moving on to kind of Mark as a as a person. Yeah. Where where did you grow up? What country, province? Um, I was born in Berlin. My dad's from the UK. My mom's from Germany. But um, at a very young age, uh, my parents decided to expatriate to South Africa. Oh. And, and I grew up in Pretoria, um, so it's actually a, a, a very nice story. It's uh, probably three k's away from the Mercedes-Benz South Africa head office. Uh, so, so uh, being able to come back to South Africa as as uh, the head of Mercedes-Benz South Africa uh, is is a journey back in time for me, and it's 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 a very nice one because um, uh, I can explore the country of my childhood where I've left 20 years ago, and and it's it's interesting to explore the place where you grew up um, in a different part of your life. So tell me about Mark as a teenager. So, you know, you you born in uh, Berlin yep. and uh, came to South Africa, yep. went back to Germany. I, 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 I basically, I spent my, my formative years until I was 18, 19 in South Africa. I did my matric in Pretoria. I did okay. my German A-levels in Pretoria. Uh, basically, basically, already at that stage, I was full on into sports, um, and 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 I think um, for me the interesting part of coming back to South Africa is that I actually realized I'm a lot more South African than than I admitted to be because I would say I'm German. I've got also a British passport, and there's a certain English way about me. Um, but I, when I studied in Germany, I, I went back to Germany in when I was 19. I, I realized there's something else about me, and only when I came back to South Africa, I noticed it's actually a lot of South Africanness in me. And um, I lived in South Africa until the early 2000s, where I, I was very lucky. I got a scholarship from Mercedes-Benz back then uh, to join Mercedes-Benz in Germany and study at a private business university in, in, in Stuttgart. Interesting. So, so, what was your dream at that age? You, uh, you know, obviously, uh, many of us dream dreams of what we're going to become, what we're going to pursue uh, uh, when you were young. And uh, uh, what did you want to become? Um, first question. And, this, and the second question is: Was it a pipe dream? And uh, did you have a path? Yeah. I mean, I must be very honest. I. I knew in my teenage years that I wanted to go, go and explore the world. I, I knew I was not going to continue living in South Africa. I wanted to see different places. I wanted to go to uh, uh, the, the big wide world. And um, early on, I, I looked at different industries or, or professions, and, and I just felt that the business direction would be the right one. Did I at that stage say I wanted to work for Mercedes-Benz, I wanted to work in the car industry, I must be honest, no I didn't. Did you have this ambition of CEO? Um, no. no. I, I would say I wanted to go places, I wanted to be successful, but um, for me it was more um, uh, I wanted to be able to change things. I wanted to be able to make an impact. I wanted to drive things. I, I think that's that's my natural way about me and, and wherever that would lead me. At that stage I I got very fortunate that I got that scholarship from Mercedes-Benz and, and, and to this day, uh, that day I thank because that kind of um, gave me that path in my career. Um, and I must Tell a quick anecdote because my daughter asked me um, actually two weeks ago and said, uh, Daddy, show me your report cards at school because she's now getting better and better at school. And I said, why well, do you want to see them? Uh, and she said, uh, I want to compare myself against you. And I said, OK. And she, she realized that my, my school report cards, my matric uh, uh, results were not as good as she expected them to be and much worse than hers. And, and, and that's probably one thing which I've realized for myself. I was, I was average at school. I wasn't that good. I got better at, at university. And I think I excel at the job I found because um, by luck or chance or by fate, I, I slipped into the direction where I'm just um, where I'm right, I found my, my true purpose or my true calling. Um, A, because um, I've discovered my love for the brand Mercedes-Benz. Um, I think we are uh, in all humbleness but, in humbleness, but the most fascinating car brand in the industry. We're the inventor of the automobile. We, we, we are probably the leader in the luxury market. Yes, there are other luxury brands, but, but the Mercedes-Benz star has that, that um, big impact and that um, big recognition factor. And, and in 
the automotive sales and marketing slash market world where I act in uh, was probably just the area where I, I found my home and, and, and that's why I've been able to, to have so many career stations at a, at a young age and just pursue that career uh, quite stringently. So, I mean, there's that, there's that saying, uh, fortune favors the brave. And uh, I think Gary Player said, the, the harder I practice, the luckier I get. Mm. Um, and, uh, and, and I suppose that, that, that analogy of discovery mm. um, of your career is, is, yeah. is one that you know, youngsters should resonate with yeah. because you don't really have this path. Right. Where, uh, unless you want to be a doctor or yeah. a, or a, or so one of the professions, yeah. a scientist, yeah. you know, then then there's a clear path. But 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 in the world of business, you often yeah. discover what you're good at, yeah. uh, and that that's what really what you're saying is you yeah. discovered your path along the way. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that really was the case with me. But um, often, when when younger colleagues ask me where did I or how did I structure my career, for me it was always important when I made career decisions is to look at the step beyond that. So in terms of uh, uh, saying, okay, where am I gonna go next? It was always, okay, where do I wanna have a step beyond that, where, where do I wanna aim? And, and for me, it's, um, I think, being brave, making bold decisions in terms of your career, um, with that, to a certain degree, exposing yourself also, because you, you willingly jump into the deep end. Being of the vulnerable, path. right? Yeah, yeah. and, and, and um, but, um, then through that also basically forcing your luck in a way but also showing to your environment that that you're willing to take a risk but you're also willing to to um manage yourself hard and 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 go to the next level and 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 probably that uh, the best way to describe it is to take yourself out of the comfort zone yeah. um and and never grow complacent always push on and 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 for me it's maybe that's why i'm also so much into the sports i do because it's the same kind of mindset which you require for for both kind of sides of the fence and 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 i've just been very fortunate that i've i've been able to do so um i've had maybe the confidence and the guts to go that way. I've had people around me who supported me, who encouraged me, who uh, defended me at times. Because uh, if if you if you go out of your comfort zone, if you if you're willing to to um, expose yourself, one or other mistake will happen. But you'll never learn yeah. um, uh, what is possible. And and driving yourself hard in that direction is, is what is required. And 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 I think if you. If you look at many leaders around the world, inspirational leaders, that's what they have done. They've taken a risk. They've um, gone where nobody else has gone. I mean, you can speak about Elon Musk um, in whichever way and form, if it's now Tesla, any of his other ventures, or if you look at Twitter, which everybody goes, okay, uh, what is he doing now yeah. again? But um, talking purely about the motor automotive industry, would we be where we would be now if Elon Musk wouldn't have taken that calculated risk or probably not calculated, but the risk, that gamble, and saying, okay, I'm going to go a completely different path. Yeah. Um, I mean, um, there, there are many things where you say, okay, we are not sure if Tesla is on the right path, but they've certainly pushed the industry uh, to disrupt from in, within themselves to drive the market into more for instance, um, electric vehicles, e-commerce, new business models, all of these things, the developments which, which we are uh, uh, um, basically seeing in the industry now, to a larger degree, are coming because he provoked it. And, and that's a well. I like that word provoked because yeah. that, that's exactly what uh, what, what I think's happened is, is provoked it. Um, so we're going to get to a, a big uh, big piece on electric vehicles in a second. And I like your uh, your your segue there into Mercedes Benz uh, first electric car. Yeah. Um, you know, back in the late 1800s. But before we get there, um, fast forward now into 20s, 30s, 40s, and yeah. uh, um, and you're a bit older and mature. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> well, a bit more mature. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, how has your thinking evolved versus when you were in your teens and twenties? Right. What What are the things that um, have changed in your mind? I think. I mean, uh, uh, I I was always, um, especially in my younger days, um, pushing hard, being uh, very open to taking risks, to to rattling the cage. Um, questioning the status quo that 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 was probably what one thing which which made me in order to to go to greater length um i think what i've learned in the last years is to 
have a better balance in that regard. Um, sometimes also think a bit more before you first speak in uh -huh. a way. Um, also um, not overreacting at the first instance. Um, but I think that that process of maturing and, and, and learning, doesn't matter how successful you're early on in your career, is invaluable. And, and um, what, what I've been very fortunate throughout my career that I've had fantastic managers, mentors, superiors, whatever you want to call them, um, who I've been able to learn um, technically, functionally, operationally, but also from communication management styles. And um, I always say there's probably not the perfect manager but um, I've always tried to stay true to myself and then pick and choose from the different individuals which I've admired or which I've looked up to and, and try to make those traits my own. So, so, so it's almost like, uh, um, you know, as a, as a leader, you shouldn't aspire to be like one person. You should pick and choose the traits from various people yeah. and make it your own. Yeah. Um, I, I think the main thing is um, every human, every person, every manager is unique and individual. You have to stay true to yourself. Yes. But you should never grow complacent or grow tired of every day trying to be the better version of yourself. And then um, looking left, right and center at other people and their good qualities and then trying just to gradually um, learn them or adapt yourself in order to, to, to become that better version of yourself. I think Elon Musk calls it the feedback loop, yeah. is, to, is to create that constant, constant feedback loop. Um, so so if, you, if you could time travel yeah. and go back in time to when you were 18. Okay. <laughs> Get a better um, haircut, wear, yeah. wear more fashionable clothes. <laughs> what would you tell your younger self? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I think um, the one thing I sometimes didn't have is patience. Um, sometimes not having patience is a good trait, um, but sometimes having a bit more patience, um, uh, thinking once or twice before you actually burst out or speak is something which is good. Would have done the one other thing which I didn't do because I was driven at that stage. Um, and I'm probably still that driven, but uh, maybe I missed out on the one or other opportunity because I was just uh, going for goal, if you wanted. Going for goal. Like, like uh, I mean, I, I think those still exist, really, because, uh, you know, not many people can do uh, the 94.7 in sub, um, uh, sub three hours and no. then fall off and still. Fall. So I think that speaks to volumes to exactly what you're, uh, what you're saying. But I think sometimes... It's, I mean, I'm just thinking about the question you asked. Sometimes um, experiencing failure, experiencing mistakes is also helpful going forward. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, many of the things I did wrong um, helped me to become the better version of myself now. And, and, and with that is probably a, a process of maturing. And, and, and um, I think there's not the right or wrong way. It's, 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 you've got a true North Star and, and there are many ways to roam. Um, but the the wrong corners you take sometimes um i mean there are obviously some things which have detrimental damage to to you as a well, person you can have the catastrophic career. failure yeah. right um, yeah. but but uh, the the smaller mistakes actually guide you in your path to 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 finding that true north as long as you course correct because yeah. yeah. you know some people don't course correct yeah. and then it get, leads to the catastrophic failure i mean i so. think the, the the core i mean um, you said Elon Musk uh, calls it the feedback loop. I would say the reflection is the important thing. Now, getting that feedback is important, but reflecting about yourself, who you are, where you want to be, and which, I mean, especially if you get high up the ranks, you get feedback left, right, and center, and some, uh, some feedback is meant very sincerely, some isn't. Yeah. Um, and then you need to be selective. What, what you make your own, and what you want to then actively change, and then change it, and what are things where you say, well, this is just who I am in a way. I really like that, like making the selection, mm -hmm. choosing. So maybe maturity gets you to choose what you want to take on board and yeah. what you don't want to take on board. Yeah. Um, and maybe when you're younger, we take on everything yeah. because we just don't know any better. Um, so do you, do you have mentors? Have you had mentors in your, in your career? Um, I think I've, I've had a few instrumental mentors. I mean, in, in, I must be honest, in, in Mercedes-Benz, I've had one mentor 
along the way from the start of my career, which is still my boss now. And, and, and it's, it's, uh, I'm not going to say it's coincidental, but um, uh, our paths crossed when I was 22, 23. And, and we just discovered that maybe he values me as an individual, I value him as, as a leader, as a manager, as, as an individual, as, as, a, as a person who gives me guidance, but who's also um, fostered my career to where I'm now. Um, but uh, for me, it's, uh, that's certainly one person, I, I must be honest, and it sounds... Um, uh, for the uh, probably not finding the right word, but my father has also given me a lot of guidance, and 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 I think that strong family base is something which which I've always cherished and and has been very very important to me. And it's not only my father, but also my mother. But my father more from out of the business sense, um, but also I, I I've, I've along the way um, I've been very very fortunate and very lucky that most of my direct superiors or managers have been um, fascinating individuals which I've learned something from um, in, in many different ways. And, and they, uh, there's probably no perfect, but picking and choosing again was, was my formula to success. And, and, and um, it's, uh, it's also probably sometimes right time, right place. Yeah. And um, well, recognizing the opportunity, yeah. right? Because oftentimes opportunity passes yeah. us and, uh, and we don't recognize yeah. it. And you, can't, you don't grab it because yeah. you don't recognize it. So, so it sounds to me like you recognize the opportunity, yeah. picked and choose, yeah. uh, and, then, and then followed the path. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's really the case. Um, so, so let's turn to your role as CEO of Mercedes-Benz South Africa. Um, what, was, what was your path to this, this current role? I mean, I, uh, and maybe I'll, I'll run through that quickly. I started off with Mercedes-Benz when I was very, very young, and, and I, I've never worked for any other company, I must be honest about it. So if you would ask me how is it working for company XYZ, I would say I don't know. Um, working in the automotive industry and working for Mercedes-Benz, I can talk for hours in a way. Um, and, and, and it was maybe by fate or coincidence that, that perfect fit. It was just um, the brand, the industry, um, the segment, and me as a person or my personality and character um, just uh, perfectly gelled in a way. And, and um, being able to work for a brand like Mercedes-Benz, I, I, I'm, I'm thankful for that every day because it's given me so much opportunity in life work-wise, but also the experiences and the places I've seen and discovered. Um, so I started off in Stuttgart. I had two stints in Dubai. Um, went back to Stuttgart um, to work as an executive assistant for one of the senior uh, management board members uh, in, in the Mercedes-Benz organization, um, which, which, which I learned a lot. It was not my favorite job, I must be honest, but it, it was also there um, that I, I, I took that leap of faith. I, I said, okay, this is an investment into my future, although it was not the favorite day-to-day -day work which I did. Um, but that gave me the springboard then to become um, VP for sales and marketing in Malaysia and Southeast Asia. We have a regional hub in Kuala Lumpur, uh, which probably is, uh, was my most fulfilling job up to now, my favorite full, most fulfilling job up to now. Um, from there, I moved on to Korea, which, which was also again then, um, I say, um, a development step, not that the role as such in Korea was bigger than in Malaysia, but acting or, or, or working in a market environment like Korea, which is fast paced, it's, it's very intense. Um, Korea, which is, is, is not known in a way, is Mercedes-Benz fifth biggest market in the world. Oh, really? Um, Can you cycle there? Yes. Yes. Okay. Fantastically. I actually cycled there just to a, a quick detour. Um, I cycled from Seoul to Busan with a work colleague, which was an amazing journey on a bicycle through through South Korea. Uh, again, exploring the country in 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 every angle and form. Um, but um, working in the Korean environment was very challenging because um, the market environment is, is is a very different one than many other markets. But it, it, I, I think it prepared me in a way for the next level and the next job. And, and, and the thing in Korea, because it's such a high profile market for us, you get a lot of exposure and, and the political dynamic to it is a lot more intense than in smaller markets. Oh, wow. 
And um, then after, after one and a half years, I got the call and was asked if I would be prepared to, to come back to South Africa or to throw in my, my hat into the ring for the position here in South Africa. Uh, which I didn't have to you think didn't about. Hesitate. I, I didn't hesitate. Not one second. I said, "Of course I would." I mean, it's the country I've grown up in. Yeah. And 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 uh, basically, I, I was two years in Korea and came to to South Africa nearly one and a half years ago. And I must say, coming back to South Africa has be, really been a blessing for me, um, uh, because um, being able to to run the brand which I love and I've worked my whole career for. In a country where I grew up on, in where I've got a lot of family relations still, a lot of friends of my parents uh, are still here, and 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 being able to um, guide Mercedes-Benz on the path of success in the country where I've got a big heart for and a big passion for is something which uh, makes me smile every morning, and and that in many different facets. So, so picking up on moving from uh, Korea to South Africa. Yeah. Um, you know, 20 years ago when I took this role as, yeah. as CEO, someone who's a dear colleague and friend of mine still, um, she said to me, uh, you're about to take the loneliest job in the world. Uh, are you sure you want it? Uh, does that resonate with you? And uh, looking back, do you see uh, a role like this sometimes as lonely, given the demands both from your shareholder as well as, uh, as the people in the business? I, I think... Um Maybe 20 years ago, that was true. Um, but I think it also has a lot to do with the individual and the leader you aspire to be. Um, so, and on top of that corporate culture, um, but all of that you can have an impact on. Um, so for me, um, I must say, I, I, knowing that I was gonna come into this role into South Africa, um, I made a deal with myself of how I want to be in that role. And, and, and obviously, if you move up, at least in our organization, from a vice president sales and marketing role, I take that, to a CEO role in, in an organization, you need to adapt, you need to change, you need to um, look at your communication style, at your management style, at your behavior patterns. Because if, if you're the second in command, you can always say the one up there, he takes the overall responsibility. So you can do things differently. You can also uh, position yourself in the company differently. Um, but coming into the role I have now, um, for me, it was very, very important that um, we as an organization, but I think many companies want to have flatter hierarchies. They want to have more modern management styles. Um, we want to communicate differently. And because I'm in comparison to a lot of my peer group, um, fairly young, I can live and breathe that because I'm probably one of the new generation. I'm one of the new generation CEOs, which, which, and, and I want to live up to that. And so uh, for me, um, a certain organizational structure and a certain hierarchy is very important because that, that governs us as an organization. But that doesn't take away that I can communicate and directly access or people can directly access me as a as, as a leader from every le level and 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 i think uh, those touch points with um, the specialist who's just joined the company to the first level managers the the directors and 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 um, living that differently um, makes you not that lonely um, and i think it's also um, the openness which you project into the organization, which then reflects back on you, um, and and um, giving people the opportunity and access to yourself uh, from little coffee chats or just, um, I think, also new office environments. Now, we were talking it, about it, and, and your office is probably a reflection of ours, which is a new style of office. We don't have closed offices anymore. So, so approaching people, being approachable, communicating, is, is so much easier not to be lonely in that sense, yeah. but you need to go the extra mile to actually do that. And you need to have, uh, I think it, it costs energy and it's effort, but it pays off so much more. I, I find that it's paid off in bucket yeah. loads. Yeah. Uh, I, took, I took her comments uh, seriously and, uh, and I promised myself it would yeah. never be lonely and yeah. it hasn't been. But Through I think the exact it's, points that you just, it, uh, you just I said. think it's 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 a general mindset. Yeah. Um, and and I can give you an anecdote or an example. When when I go visit our dealerships, 
I make sure that I go to every department, to every area, and I say hello in person to the service advisor, the sales manager, or the person who works in our parts department. Because A, um, having that personal interaction is what is important for me that makes my job fun. The people element, I mean, that was one of, uh, because you were asking about mentors, one, one of my early managers said to me, um, car business is people business and and i've kept that until today because i think we can have the best dealerships we can have the best processes we can have the best products we can have the best brands if we don't and we on top of it we probably can have the best strategy if we don't have the people to execute it we're worth nothing and and that from every level from the last technician to the highest ceo of any dealer group and 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 realizing that and paying tribute to that and and um also um showing that appreciation to each individual is something which is, is dearly important to me. Fascinating. I, 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 can, I can only imagine and, uh, and, and, and resonate with why Mercedes-Benz is as successful as it is. But no interview is going to be complete, Mark, <laughs> without talking about um, sustainability and, uh, and the future of electric vehicles in the country. So, so my first you know, kind of quirky question is Mercedes-Benz introduced uh, four EQ models yes. in the last uh, year. Very proud of that. A very, 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 very beautiful cars. Um, the EQA, the EQB, the EQC. And then what I can't understand is they've skipped a couple of letters and we've got the EQS. Yeah. So um, is the uh, EFGHI coming um, <laughs> or is there a reason that the letters have been skipped? Before I answer and tap into that question, I need to comment on one of the things which you said at the beginning. Um, uh, you said I, I, I was um, instrumental in launching 50 cars in, in under five years. That was during my tenure in Malaysia. And yeah. that was, I, I was very proud of that because um, when, when I came to Malaysia, our product portfolio was actually very slim. And I thought we've got so much more opportunity in Malaysia or Southeast Asia if we would just expand our offering and, and show the fascinating products which, which we have as a brand. Um, and I always believe um, uh, being a luxury brand is the brand element, it's the product, the product substance as it, it's quality and it's the customer service or, or um, everything which has to do with a customer. So, so going on a, product, on a product offensive has always been top of mind for me in any market I've been acting in. And, and that's also something which, which um, I wanted to do in, in South Africa. And, and, and the obvious low hanging fruit for me obviously in, in South Africa was that um, uh, South Africa in terms of the EV revolution, if I can call it, is at the tail end. I mean, um, a year ago, or even at the beginning of this year, um, I think uh, they were in total, I don't think, but the, the 300 electric vehicles on the road of South Africa. Yeah. And, 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 and there's so much opportunity. And if we see the development in other markets, um, why shouldn't that happen to South Africa? And um, on top of that, um, if you look at the direction we as a company are going, but also many other brands, we've already announced that post 2030, we will only be producing electric vehicles. So if we like it or not for South Africa, we need to wrap our heads around. If we want to sell modern day cars going forward, we need to um, uh, transform the market into an EV or e-mobility space. And, and for me, that is not a threat for South Africa, but a huge opportunity. Mm. Why do I say that? Because um, if you look at the South African context, and we all know the reasons, um, power supply and electricity has been a challenge. But society and the people living in South Africa to a large degree have already adapted in that regard. So especially in the Mercedes-Benz segment, which is obviously yeah. a, a privileged segment, many people have gone off the grid. I always say 50% have gone off the grid or the other 50% are going off the grid or thinking about it. The transition to electric mobility is so much easier because I mean, in Europe or, or even in Korea or China, um, people haven't thought about where electricity actually comes from, yeah. seriously. And only since, um, uh, uh, the Ukraine war, people in Europe have considered, okay, where does electricity come from? Where does energy come from? Should we be thinking about alternative sources? That, that transition already has happened in South Africa. And, and bearing that in mind, the EV revolution in South Africa makes so much more sense. And I think also um, consumers in South Africa are 
so much more agile and willing to adapt because of circumstances they are faced with. Resilient. Yeah, resilient. Yeah, really, yeah. Uh, that I think that the transition to EV will become, at least in the topper end of the market, will be much quicker than in Europe, for instance. Um, and and uh, basically taking that mindset of going onto a product offensive, uh, the low hanging fruits in terms of the EV market, and that we actually haven't launched electric vehicles was just for me a no-brainer that we need to own that topic. We need to own that topic in terms of um, launching all of these models for at the first stage, um, but also um, to being the thought leader in that space. That, that was very important for me because I think um, South Africa being at the tail end of that development can benefit from that yeah. situation. It's not, it's not something which is bad. It's something which we can learn from other markets. We can look at the mistakes they made and uh, do it better. But doing it better, we need to actually analyze and see how should we set the e-mobility ecosystem up in South Africa. And for me, um, those are, in my view, three core topics. It's price parity. We need to give electric vehicles a fair chance in the market. Secondly, it's um, charging infrastructure because we're obviously only starting that. And, and thirdly is a holistic ecosystem. Like for instance, we need to train our first responders because handling a accident situation of an electric vehicle in comparison to an internal combustion engine is a totally different requirement. Yeah. Um, but because we're only starting that, we've got the chance to do it right and to learn from others. Um, now, tapping into your question, um, uh, I obviously, when I came here, we saw that we hadn't launched the electric vehicles and we knew it was coming. Um, now, for me, it was important that we make a big impact for the market. And that's why I said, okay, let's bundle these cars. On a global level, we first came with the EQC, then the EQS, EQA and EQB. And I said, okay, let's group them together and go for a full onslaught. Um, now I'm gonna uh, blurt it out or uh, give a sneak preview into the kitchen. Uh, start of next year, we're, we're launching the EQE, oh, wow. which then completes that portfolio. Um, and, and then um, on a global basis, we've already launched the EQS SUV and the EQE SUV, which will be launching uh, in the course of 2023. And then meaning by the second half of next year, we will have seven electric vehicles for our valued customers to choose from. That's which quite a quick ramp up. Yes. Uh, it's a very quick ramp up if I think about, uh, you know, other models that have, yeah. uh, that have launched in South Africa, yeah. you know, so they're up to seven within one year. That's, uh, that's what for I'm me, that was important because we need to show all the alternatives and the possibilities. So if you are a Mercedes-Benz customer now, in, in a few months' time, you'll have an equivalent electric vehicle for every segment we're in probably. So from an EQA to an EQS and the SUV derivatives, we'll, we'll have everything in place. So if you are in the market, for instance, for a GLE, we'll have an EQE SUV. If you're in the market for a GLA, we've got an EQA. Um, if you're looking at the S-Class segment, we've got the top range, the best electric vehicle on the market, the EQS. Um, and so then it's the consumer's choice if they want to go for an internal combustion engine because they feel that suits their purposes better, which, which we're happy to, to provide them. Obviously, our, our fascinating luxury cars, which, which uh, are known from the A-Class up to the G-Class if you want it, or if they want to go into a performance car like an AMG or our super luxury cars, the Mercedes Maybach range, or the next level technology, the state-of-the-art Mercedes EQ. That, that, that's fascinating. So you touched a little bit on uh, you know whether a, whether a customer wants to choose an internal combustion engine vehicle not, uh, or not, um, or an iced vehicle, or should I say, or, a, or an EV. So so how does that then translate into phasing out of internal combustion engine vehicles as it relates to South Africa? And then how does that impact local manufacturer and imports? You know what is Mercedes Benz's path to the phasing out of iced vehicles? I mean, in in general, and that's been announced on a global level. Bit by bit, they're going to be phasing out, and by post 2020, 2030, um, there is going to be only electric vehicles produced. Um, this will be managed in in a, in a coordinated process, meaning if, for instance, um, one model comes to its end of its life cycle, it will be pro, uh, uh, replaced by an equivalent or a, a lookalike electric vehicle or a new vehicle in our range. 
Um, in South Africa, um, A, I must say, um, we're very happy that, that uh, South Africa is the production plant where we produce the C-Class made in South Africa for the world and and uh, recently in October we launched the C43 the C63 for the South African market where we took um, our dear friends from the media to our production plant in East London which I need to underline is state of the art in comparison to any other production plant in the world and 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 also there to the surprise of many of, of um, your media colleagues um, for instance, the C43 and C63 is exported even to China. Yeah. So, so um, A, we've got a production plant which is state of the art. Um, it's one of our mother plants in, in our global production footprint. And, and, and we've invested just recently over 13 billion rands in upgrading our production plant in East London. And, and, and from a diesel to a petrol to a plug-in hybrid, we can produce anything in, in, in that plant. Um, now, you would ask probably the question, um, I haven't seen any plug-in hybrids uh, C-classes on the road in South Africa. Um, those are all exported to the US and other markets, for instance. Um, but um, in terms of the future of that, we're now assessing what is the best way forward and obviously in close discussions with um, the government in terms of how can we structure the future of East London in, in, in our portfolio. So does that mean that uh, we could potentially begin producing uh, full battery electric vehicles in the country uh, for Mercedes-Benz? Or do you see a path where it's still quite a while of importing um, electric vehicles? Um, I need to answer that question in, in, in two different layers. Number one, is the competence there? Yes, because the step up from producing a plug-in hybrid to an electric vehicle is not, not such a big leap. Um, at this moment, all electric vehicles will be imported into South Africa and, and um, currently there are ongoing discussions in terms of what the future of producing automobiles in South Africa will look like between us other manufacturers and the government and and I think it's going to be an interesting space to watch in the coming year or two how that's going to develop um, how uh, the the uh, mark dynamics also develop for me um, the the first step on that journey is developing that local mark demand in South Africa and for that I think the three key items are really price priority, infra, uh, inf infrastructure for charging, and thirdly, that holistic ecosystem. And with that, we can really accelerate EV sales and, and hopefully Mercedes EQ sales in South Africa. And, and looking at the launch which we had in August and the first response from our customers is, uh, it, it's been overwhelming. I mean, I was always, uh, I now use the term gung-ho and very optimistic about it, um, but but um, basically we're sold out until the end of the year. We wow. are very optimistic about growth rates and actually we're in a situation, especially for our electric vehicles, that the demand is far outreaching the supply and and um, maybe it's, it's, it's also uh, uh, the topic of that, especially in the higher end segments, there are a lot of early adapters and a lot of people which are willing to keep and take that leap of faith or to be technology leaders or being observed by that. Because, I mean, Mercedes-Benz is a luxury brand and, and having the latest state-of-the-art technology is also a certain form of luxury. And maybe that's the reason why, why we've been very successful in launching these cars. I must say the EQS, I was added to Festival of Motor. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, it is it is really an, an, a next level car, you know, that, that electric vehicle. So changing gears a little bit, uh, Mark, um, uh, Mercedes-Benz have done a lot of firsts. Yeah. You guys were um, first with the electric vehicle, to my knowledge, yeah. back in the late 1800s. You and I weren't born yet. Um, late 1800s, uh, Mercedes-Benz tried to pioneer the first electric vehicle. Didn't take off because of battery issues, yeah. but it wasn't Mercedes-Benz's fault. It was yeah. you know, just ahead of its time. Um, um, and then one other thing that you've done is, uh, I believe you've pioneered the agency model in mm. South Africa going yep. direct to the consumer. Yep. So first question is, how has that gone, number one? And, uh, and then um, in the essence of that question is, what is the OEM as Mercedes-Benz, how does it see the future role of car dealerships 
mm. in because I mean car dealerships today are uh, uh, are small businesses, they're SMEs, they're owned by the actual um, you know dealer themselves. Whereas whereas now you've you've flipped the model, going direct to the consumer, have this agency model. What is the future role of the car dealership yeah. in Mercedes Benz's mind? I, I think. Um Introducing the agency model into the South African market for Mercedes-Benz was a visionary step, but it was also a pilot. So for Mercedes-Benz globally, the first market to go into an agency model was South Africa. And um, we used South Africa, if I can say it that way, as a testbed. Um, why? Because South Africa has um, so many reasons for that. Um, on the one hand, South Africa has a lot of world presence, if you can say it that way, in combination with not being the biggest market in the world anymore. Um, uh, people are very resilient and our dealerships, our organization, but they're also very agile in adapting new forms, new paths, new technology in a way. And, and um, they're very progressive in their approach, uh, approach in many ways. So, so for us as an organization, as a company, South Africa was a perfect market to test that and to see if that would be our future business model. Is that suitable in order to transform the way we do business? And now, fast forwarding five years down the road, we can see A, that the response or the satisfaction from our side, from our network, but also from customers is overwhelming. Um, I think you could go to any dealer slash agent, any network partner which we have in South Africa, and they would say, we never would want to go back. Especially if you look at the development, 2017, we kickstarted it. We had in between a, a market downturn. Uh, we had uh, certain situations where we had stock issues. We had a COVID situation. We had a supply issue where we didn't have enough stock. Throughout all of those times, um, our partners, our local partners in the network have come to the realization, and us as well, that this is actually the best business model to, to operate in going forward. Well, I guess they don't have to carry stock, right? Because yes. Mercedes-Benz yes. carries the stock. I mean, that's, that's <clears throat> from a business partner perspective. But you as a consumer... You wouldn't know. You actually have an added benefit because you're normally going to your local dealership in Whitbank. I'm yeah. just inventing now. Yeah. Um, and in Whitbank, they would have three C-classes, one, one white, one black, one gray. They would have a GLC, they would have a GLE and an S-class. And they would try to sell you those cars which you have on stock. But maybe you're in the market for red C-class, just for argument's sake. Now, with the agency model, the stock is centralized and each consumer has access to the nationwide stock. And, and as an agent or as a, as, a, as a retailer or a dealer, you are able to sell to your customer the product which he wants. So he doesn't need to shop around, nor does he need to go with the white C-class if he wants a red one. So they're, they're, to, to all stakeholders, they're, they're instrumental benefits to it. And, and on top of it, um, we can ensure that each customer gets the best possible deal on it. Um, plus, we can make sure that, that um, all cars are available for the consumer, uh, for the consumer and by that um, having a convenience, but also uh, customer satisfaction in that regard. Um, obviously, we learned a lot all, uh, on that path, and when we started off, not everything was perfect. I mean, not everything is gold which shines. Yes. But um, learning in South Africa, perfecting the model, and then saying exporting it from South Africa, which I know we all love, um, to other markets around the world, and, and now we're live in, in markets like Sweden, we're live in markets like Austria, like India, uh, like Australia, we've announced we're going to go live with the agency model in Germany, and other markets to follow, um, I think it has proven itself, and, and, and in a South African context, other brands have followed, um, and I really think that's the future of, of us as a business model, um, for the benefit us as a manufacturer, the, our dealer partners or agent partners, and also especially the consumer. So for new cars, it's been massively successful. Yes. I mean, it's rolling out to the rest of the world, and yeah. you know, whoever's watching this, it was done here first. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in South very proud, proudly, proudly South African. Proudly South African. Um, but, but how does that then translate into the second-hand vehicle market, but more specifically into the future of the second-hand EV market? 
you know, how much, uh, um, how much or how close does Mercedes-Benz or an OEM for that matter get to the second-hand market and, and, and have you thought about that or is it not something on an OEM's radar? I mean, um, over the last, uh, I would say, over the last 30 years we've been very active in the second-hand market. Um, we've got uh, certified pre-owned programs which we've implemented in every market in the world, including South Africa. Um, in South Africa we took the active step to not include it into the agency model. Um, there are one or two other markets where we've actively taken the step in including it into the agency model. Um, I think there are pros and cons for both. Um, obviously the, the used car or pre-owned market is a lot more complex because you've got many different players and, and I think giving customers, giving consumers alternatives and options is is the right for, way forward. I think there's not the one path in, in, in previously owned cars in saying okay everything needs to be done through something like an agency model. I think having that that competitive element in the used car market is also something which is beneficial to all players. Um, and I think um, for, for South Africa as a market I see the status quo as we have it now continuing for, for a longer while and then we need to see where the market develops. In terms of electric vehicles, it's a very interesting question. Um, number one, I need to say um, we as a brand have gone ahead and said uh, for all our electric vehicles, we set the residual values for electric vehicles on the same level of um, internal combustion engine. If you ask me personally, I think actually over time the the residual value of electric vehicles will be higher, higher. Than, than internal combustion engines. But that's something which we need to see and analyze and assess as time goes by. Um, but if you look at, at electric vehicles, we as a manufacturer, when we brought our, um, our Mercedes EQ vehicles to the market, we said, number one, every electric vehicle will come with a free home charger installed um, in order to provide that charging infrastructure also at your home. Number two, we said, um, we will provide a minimum eight-year battery warranty in order to give that peace of mind to the customer, plus a six-month free battery health check, which are the main concerns, actually, charging and battery health. Because everything else on the car is quite simple. Yeah. It's a, I mean, if you look at an electric vehicle, it's got the same steering wheel, it's got the same wheels, it's got the same uh, infotainment system, if we can say it, or similar yeah. to, to an internal combustion engine. But the battery and the electric drivetrain is, and the charging is where the main concerns or area for concerns are for the consumers and, and we've covered that and with that we believe that um, selling electric vehicles to a second hand market will be just as smooth as with internal combustion engines. Actually I think the demand will be much much higher because the market will be going in that direction and then the first mark, uh, electric vehicles which will be coming into a used car space will be highly sought after. That's uh, that's fascinating, and uh, you know, I suppose uh, um, you know the the second hand market is is quite an interesting and dynamic uh, dynamic world, especially in South Africa, because used cars are. Um, are, are not commodities. They're yeah. very unique in their yes. own right. Yes. Um, and I suppose a difficult path to, to follow. But, um, you know, moving away from electric vehicles a little bit, what is the typical life in the day of Mark Rain? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I get up and I must be, I, I heard this morning on the radio, uh, what do you do first? And I'm, I'm one of these guys who actually, first thing is I check my phone. I, I have that anxiety and to see, did I get any messages? Are there any emails? Is there any crisis? I need to read what, what has happened on the other side of the world. Um, I wouldn't be able to stop myself. Um, most of the mornings I get up and I do sports. I go running, I go cycling. Um, I make an effort um, to get up that hour earlier mm -hmm. because, um, A, as I said in the beginning, um, it, it gives me my sanity. Um, it also um, gives me energy. So, so people often ask me, uh, you know, you've got such a stressful job. And then you do sports, aren't you drained by that? No, it gives me energy. energy yeah. um, I normally get home and then have a coffee with my partner, uh, which is kind of the half an hour in the morning where it's, it's just our we time, not our me time, but our we time, if you want it that way, uh, which is an important element of uh, uh, starting to the day. Um, I would normally be in the office um, around about 8.30ish, 
um, when I was younger, I started earlier, but I, I, I kind of um, set myself uh, 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 that target or that rhythm that I, I take a bit of time every morning for myself, if, if it's sport or just private time, um, before I start work, because I know my day is going to be long. Yeah. And, and, and that's probably also a, an important thing which I've learned throughout my career to, to prioritize and to also prioritize yourself in that regard. Um, and then I've obviously got a packed day in the office. Um, I, I normally, I, I, I manage my schedule back to back, um, which, which I, I think that's just essential because um, if we're not at top speed, if we're not always one step ahead, if we're not um, on top of our game, there's going to be somebody who's going to be doing that. And, and I'm not going to say it's a war or it's a fight, but we're in competition and that competition is healthy. And I love competition. It's if I go running or cycling, that's the thing which drives me, but that drives me also in my work day, um, in, in everything, being always one step ahead, um, being faster, being better. Um, what I though try to do is throughout my work day, I also have that pockets and that moments where I can engage with people. That's important, that personal engagement. I, uh, I'm entirely useless working from home. I want that personal contact. Um, and, and, and having those moments where you can have a coffee with somebody and, and, and that, in my view, has so much value for myself but also for the people I engage with or, or driving topics also. Um, and, and the new working environment with, with uh, more seamless working, having an open office environment, going out to visit dealers. I'm, I'm very much also very much at the dealers, visiting them, speaking to them, enga engaging with them, interacting with them. That gives me value and I think gives them value as well. So what keeps you motivated every day, every week, every month? Uh, what keeps you going? Um, if you had to pick one thing. I, say, I would say it's the resident, uh, relentless drive to to be more successful. So if I if I um, go back to a sport analogy, if I run 10 k's at 50 minutes, the next time I want to run it under 50 minutes. If I run a marathon at three hours, I want to maybe get that nudge below that. Um, challenging yourself and 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 just getting better at what you do not growing complacent with what you have is of essence for me. And then, and then finally, Mark, what are the top three leadership or business lessons that you've experienced, good or bad? Um, I think uh, number one is um, you can only be jointly successful. You can only be successful in a team environment. Um, uh, as I said earlier, you can have the best strategy, but if you don't have the people, it, it doesn't matter if it's if it's your own organization, if it's your business partners, any stakeholder, um, you can only be successful if they're engaged and if you're there driving the topic and and um, it's getting the best out of them. Uh, I think secondly, it's you never can over communicate. Um, communication, alignment, getting people on board. Um, getting people on the same page. It's not getting them on your page, but finding common ground is, 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 uh, is of essence. Because if, if there's a, a, a vast difference in viewpoint or direction, then you're not going to be successful. Um, and, and, and thirdly is, is always driving yourself setting your bar one higher, never growing complacent. And, and that energy needs to be stall installed into the organization. Well, that's been fascinating, Mark. So uh, finally, thank you so much, thank Mr. You for Mark Rain, for, uh, for being my guest on uh, the autobiography. I, uh, a lot of what you've said has resonated, um, not only with me, but Autotrader as a business. And uh, I can see now why you are so successful in your personal right, and why Mercedes-Benz is as sex su successful as it is in those countries you've been to, as well as in South Africa. So uh, I wish you all of the success, and uh, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. I think to close uh, this off from my side, 
I need to do a deal with you. Uh -huh. Number one, we need to go on a drive with the EQS together because uh, you said it's a fascinating car. I believe you haven't been behind the wheel. I have And uh, the best way to get to know it is obviously behind the wheel. And I need to get you back on the bicycle once I'm fit again. <laughs> I think that's a challenge I might just take up. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.